Welcome back everyone to another Star Wars retrospective. Today we're covering one of the best old school Star Wars classics out there, Dark Forces. Star Wars Dark Forces is a first person shooter released in 1995 for MS-DOS and the original Macintosh. Yeah, this game is not only older than I am, it's older than the Windows operating system. Both developed and published by LucasArts, Dark Forces sought to contribute further to what we used to call the Expanded Universe, but now simply referred to as the Legends continuity. So, back when the franchise had a soul. Jedi scum! We have a job to do, Anakin. Try not to upset him. The story takes place mostly between A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back, but doesn't really tie into the movies all that much, with the exception of the first mission, which takes place right before A New Hope. A lot of you may not realize it, but this game was revolutionary. Until this point in time, Star Wars didn't really have any kind of first-person action game. There were some flight sims and arcade-style titles, but nothing to really compete with the other video games that were storming the industry at the time. The idea of a first-person Star Wars game dawned on the LucasArts staff after seeing that fans had modded the monolithic FPS game, Doom, to feature levels set on the Death Star. Even back then, fans were modding games to have Star Wars things. This caused the developers at LucasArts to realize there was a market for an FPS Star Wars game just waiting to be filled. Now, most developers at the time were creating their games on top of John Carmack's revolutionary software advancements, which meant most shooters at the time just felt like Wolfenstein 3D with a different coat of paint. LucasArts, however, had a different idea. They decided they wanted their game to be more than just a shooter. They wanted their game to feel more like an adventure game than just a series of levels to kill things. So they coded their own engine, which they appropriately titled the Jedi Engine. This allowed them a slew of features that we didn't see in Doom at the time, such as jump and duck functionalities, swimming mechanics, voice acting, animated cutscenes, and of course, the ability to look up and down. I mean, they must have really built it from scratch too, because the Wolfenstein 3D source code wasn't made open source until 1995, which is not only the year Dark Forces released, but two years after it began development. That being said, other games had already released on Wolf 3D's engine like Blakestone, so I'm really not sure how much, if any, of Carmack's code was involved in the Jedi engine. Code isn't really my strength, so if you know, go ahead and drop a comment on it. Dark Forces initially only launched on computers, but was ported to the Sony PlayStation a year later in 1996. This PS1 port was the version a lot of you probably knew, and it was pretty similar to the PC version too. For all intents and purposes, the game is the same across every iteration. Unlike Shadows of the Empire, where the cutscenes are CGI on the PC and slideshows on the N64. The biggest difference between the PC version and the PS1 Dark Forces port are the textures and in-game animations, which are slightly better on the PC MS-DOS version. However, you might have noticed that the one I'm playing looks unusually good. Well, let me tell you why. In order to get it running in a higher resolution and with more adjustable settings, I went to what's called the Force Engine, a fan-made port of Dark Forces into a fully modernized engine with key mapping, graphical settings, higher resolutions, and more. One of the features of this new engine is post-processing effects, which serve sort of like their own little remaster. Added effects for blasters, bloom, basically a remaster of the game into a really beautiful version of the original. This footage isn't going to be authentic to how it would have played back in the 90s, but that's not really what I'm going for. This is going to be a very modern take on playing it, complete with mouse look, a crosshair, etc. The officially licensed remaster by Night Dive Studios isn't out yet as of making this video, and it absolutely looks great. However, I will say that if you're wanting to play it right now, or if the remaster ends up being bad somehow, this is more than a reasonable and wonderful way to experience the game. It feels great, and I can't recommend it enough. Let's set up the story of Dark Forces. We play as mercenary Kyle Katarn. Raised as an agricultural mechanic by his father, Kyle joined the Imperial Academy after getting the news that his father had been murdered by the Rebellion. After finishing his time in the Academy, Kyle crossed paths with the rebel agent Jan Ors, who was uncovering the truth about his parents' murder. They were killed by the Empire, not the Rebel Alliance but the Empire covered up the crime by blaming it on the Rebels and fabricating a story to be spread. Upon learning this truth, Kyle parted ways with Jan for a time and began to develop a distrust of the Empire. 
He ended up fully defecting from the Empire after Jan, whom he had begun to like, got captured by the Empire and he chose rescuing her over his loyalty to the Imperials. Following this, rather than join the rebels whom he still didn't trust, he started offering up the skills he had learned in the academy to whoever paid the most as a mercenary. All of this is covered in a very compelling novella called Dark Forces, Soldier for the Empire, which is pretty easy to find and short to read. Additionally, you can try the audiobook of the novella, which is great as well, but the voice actor for Kyle is so terrible it almost ruins the quality of everything else. I mean, he does a good job with what he can, but he's terribly miscast as his voice doesn't really match the character. All of this has led us to where we are now. This is Star Wars Dark Forces. This mission is a little iconic, to be honest. It's the only mission in the game that takes place before A New Hope and shows how important Kyle Katarn is to the universe. Because on this mission titled Operation Skyhook, he breaks into a secret base on the planet Danuta and steals the Death Star plans. The location to the plans was leaked to the rebels by the librarian Autor Raiten, who had become a rebel sympathizer after learning about the Death Star. Worried about the potential collateral damage that would be caused if the Rebels sent in a commando team, they opted instead to hire mercenaries Kyle and Rihanna Saren, though her involvement is not included in the game in any way. That's right, Kyle Katarn stole the Death Star plans, and he did it by infiltrating the facility, executing some Imperial officers and troopers, and bailed out. Dropping in from the roof of the base, we're gonna pull some rebel scum action and shoot two unsuspecting stormtroopers in the back, very much embodying the rogue smuggler mentality. After that, we head outside where we can really see this is a very small base. It's clear they were trying to keep this hidden to some degree because we're in the middle of nowhere. Seriously, this location is very well hidden. Also, I spent way too long running around this place trying to figure out where to go. We have to head back inside, by the way. There they are, the plans to the Imperial Death Star. I guess this makes us implicit in the deaths of the 1.5 million people who were killed when the Death Star blew up, or rather was blown up in an act of galactic terrorism. Do your part to fight back. Enlist today. Anyway, with the plans in hand, we run back to the roof where our extraction comes to get us out of here. Jan Ors, who is currently piloting the Moldy Crow. We hop aboard and take the Rebels the Death Star plans. It's a great tutorial mission, and as you can see, the Force Engine has rendered everything out beautifully. Following this mission, we're going to time skip several years and begin the actual plot of Dark Forces. Kyle delivers the plans to the Rebel Alliance. Soon afterwards, the Death Star is destroyed. But even as the Alliance celebrates this victory, another sinister plot is set in motion that will become an even greater concern for the Rebellion. Your test demonstration, General Monk. Thank you, Lord Vader. What I unveil today will mark a new era for the Empire. We will be able to decimate the Rebels just as we did the Jedi Knights. At last, the Emperor's war will be filled only with the glory and beauty of decisive victory. A noble cause, General. I hope the demonstration lives up to your claims. Proceed. With pleasure. Dark Trooper, release. General. 
The Emperor will be most pleased. Continue with your project. Certainly, Lord Vader. Thank you, Commander, for responding at such short notice. The Empire has been keeping us on the run since the destruction of the Death Star. Five days ago, the Empire attacked one of our secret bases in the city of Talay. was destroyed within minutes. Many innocent people in the surrounding city as well as the rebel staff were killed. Intelligence thinks that this may be an act of retaliation for the destruction of the Death Star. Interesting. This looks like it could be a normal Imperial attack. Except for those sounds. Very perceptive, Commander. I know you understand that all we discuss here is classified. This Imperial officer, Crix Medine, wishes to defect to the Alliance. He has supplied us with information on the development of a new Imperial weapon. Those sounds you heard, we believe, come from that weapon. A new type of Stormtrooper, the Dark Trooper. A new Stormtrooper that can take out a Rebel base that quickly? I should have kept working for the Empire. The Rebel Command is not taking this lightly. They have authorized me to hire you, to find out if there is a threat, and if there is, to shut it down. That is, if you are still on our side. This could be interesting. Alright, I'm in. But I think I'll need some help on this one. I want Jan Ors as my mission officer. Certainly. Then I will let Jan brief you further on your mission objectives. Thank you, Commander. And may the Force be with you. Skipping ahead a couple of years, the Death Star is destroyed and Kyle has been offered another contract from the Rebellion. This takes place between Episodes 4 and 5. Meeting once again with Mon Mothma, Kyle is informed that an Imperial officer, Crix Maydeen, is preparing to defect from the Empire and join the Rebel Alliance. This is really cool because it unintentionally ties into the story of Rogue Squadron, which would release three years later for the N64, depicting Luke and Rogue Squadron's rescue of Crix Maydeen as he solidified his defection on Corellia, an event you get to play in that game. But in this game, we're only hearing about his preparations to defect. Still helps it all feel connected. General Maydeen informs the Rebels that the Imperials have just attacked and destroyed the formerly hidden Rebel hideout called Tak Base on the planet Talay. The thing is, they did so using a form of Imperial trooper no one has ever seen before. No one seems to know what these troopers are or where they come from, but they were significantly more powerful than the average trooper. So Kyle is contracted to go to the ruins of Tak Base and try to discover what happened here. And the level is awesome. It feels about as much like a destroyed hidden base as I think you could accomplish on this engine in 1995. On first arrival, it can be a little confusing to learn the layout, but that's just getting you prepped for what's to come, honestly. Of course, I end up running out of ammo and having to just beat a few troopers to death. The power to the whole base has been shut down by the Imperial Presence, so the first thing I need to do is activate the generator. And... It's cool they bothered to show mountains in the skybox to emphasize the distant Outer Rim Planet vibe, honestly, and the purple sky, too. With the power back on, we're able to activate the bridge so we can cross over into the Rebel Base HQ, where we find something was left behind here. Something very large. A weapon of some kind. Grabbing that, we have our evidence. It's time to get off this planet before reinforcements arrive. We take that strange weapon back to the Rebels, where they're able to deduce who manufactured it. It's all the information they could gather, however, so we're going to have to go find that manufacturer and bring him to the Rebels for interrogation to gain more insight.
What they can tell us is that the guy who designed this weapon is named Moff Rebus, who's a well-known Imperial weapons engineer. We also happen to know where he may be hiding out. On the planet Anoit, specifically hiding in the sewer system within the capital, Anoit City. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. This mission is convoluted. It's not very big, but it feels that way at first since almost all of it is underground, and there's a lot of tunnels to get lost in. Thankfully, there seems to be no Imperial presence beyond a few probe droids, which we can dispatch those pretty easily. This seems to be a hub from which to access all the different passageways within the local sewer system. According to our info from Jan, he's gone out of his way to engineer a series of drain switches to prevent anyone from figuring out how to get to his lab, which is hidden within this sewer. That means we will have to find these drain switches and turn them off, which is easier said than done. Except, what the hell is that? Alright, so this sewer is loaded with small Dianogas. At least, I hope they're all small. I haven't forgotten about that last time. Man, this place is elaborate. And dark. It took me a little bit to figure out I had night vision, I'll admit, so I was lighting my path with blaster shots, wasting my ammo. Fortunately, I did eventually realize I had night vision, which made it a little easier to navigate. We found a good few switches at this point, so we can... That was something. We also get introduced to an old friend also from Shadows of the Empire. Remote droids, and they're just as infuriating in this mission as they were in Shadows. Seriously, you have to like aim above where they are to hit them. Eventually we get the switches flipped and gain access to Moff Rebus's lab, where he has a handful of Imperial Stormtroopers guarding him. No matter, Imperial Stormtroopers are our speciality. Carving our way through his team of bodyguards, we get introduced to some platforming, which, to my shock, is easy and fluid. Again, this game not only predates Quake, it was released only one year after Doom 2, and it features jumping, crouching, and the ability to look up and down. I'm just saying, this game was genuinely a pioneer of tech at the time. Anyway, there he is, Moff Rebus. Putting a gun to his head, Kyle takes him prisoner and hands him over to the Rebels. Although he was apparently resistant to the Rebels' interrogation, they got the most important information out of him by letting him rant about himself, in which he revealed that it was his new weapons that devastated the planet Fest via something called the Dark Trooper Project. Whatever these Dark Troopers are, they're incredibly dangerous, and we need more intel as soon as possible. Still on contract with the Rebels, Kyle and Jan head to the planet Fest, to an old Imperial research facility hidden in the mountains. And as you can see, that is no exaggeration. I know I've said it multiple times, but pulling this off in 1995, realistically 1994, which is when this was being made, is insane. There's a lot more platforming here, leaping across these caverns, shooting stormtroopers. I love this, and it feels smooth and really cool to play also. Granted, the Force engine is making this whole process look and feel better to experience than it would have in 95, but still. Do you see what I'm saying now? Even when I'm pointing right at it, these damn remote droids are impossible to hit. And this mission is where the game really starts to feel like a Star Wars game. If I'm being honest, when I think of old Star Wars games, the look of Dark Forces doesn't come to mind. Old Star Wars games have a charm to them for some reason, and this looks and feels so different from all the other games of that era. This mission, however, is when that charm showed a little, because we get our blocky gray Imperial base rooms, a genuine staple of old Star Wars games is to have Imperial bases with blocky gray rooms. I utterly adore this design too. The touched up graphical additions like the Bloom are really helping it feel like a treat to experience. So this room is locked and someone has the key. Guess I'll have to find it. Here I go killing again. After finding the code to the door, we can input it and see this phenomenal technological achievement. This is seriously so impressive. 
This game predates Shadows of the Empire, and although it didn't have nearly as much ambition with its models, 3D gameplay, and graphics at the time, the graphics and gameplay of Dark Forces has aged far better. With our sample for the Dark Trooper ammo in hand, it's time to get the hell off this planet. Okay, now it's time to leave. Thanks to the sample we found in the Imperial Research Facility, the Rebels learned that the armor plating for these dark troopers is from a material called Frick. You freaking Fricks! Well, it didn't take much to decide that the Imperial Mining Facility on the Blood Moon of Groma 16, where they were mining the mineral, needed to be destroyed. And who better than our boy Kyle to do it? Grabbing our sequencer charge, we're off to infiltrate and blow up a mining facility. Now is a great time to bring up the fact that this game's music is actually dynamic. Depending on if you're in combat or exploring, the intensity of the music will change to reflect that. I can't actually think of another game at the time that was doing that. It's pretty straightforward this time, break in, plant the charge, go home. Which after finding the power coupling, we're able to do. See? Easy. That is a dark trooper. So we have this mechanical monstrosity chasing us through the bowels of this mining facility with every intention to terminate. But like any other droid, it's slow and vulnerable to explosions. Kind of. I'm with Kyle, it's past time to say goodbye to Groma 16 for good. This contemptible excuse for an officer will no longer divulge any more information to that rebel, Kyle Katarn. Katarn will not be as easy to deal with. He is very resourceful. More resourceful, it seems, than even your dark troopers. I understand the threat, Lord Vader. Katarn was once an impressive Imperial officer, but he was weak and gave up on the struggle for our new order. I wouldn't put much faith in his abilities. Katarn will never come near this ship. My new hire will see to that. Remember earlier how I was talking about Crix Maydeen's involvement between this game and Rogue Squadron? Well, we know that he was rescued by Rogue Squadron on Corellia after his defection, but he required rescue a second time, however, by Kyle Katarn. See, Maydeen was located and captured by the Empire for his treason and stuffed into an Imperial detention center on Oranakra, where he awaits execution. Not if anything to say about it. Well, here we are, Oranakra. As you can see, the place is known for its barren landscape and predominantly stone surfaces, which of course made it an irresistible locale for the Empire to put a prison on. Let's try not to end up a permanent resident of this depressing place. We can see the exterior of the prison from here, but there's probably some kind of external entrance for guards to come and go. Ah, exactly like that. This should get us into the prison, but it feels exceedingly dangerous. Hasn't the Empire ever heard of guardrails? Of all the bad ideas, breaking into an Imperial detention center where they hold people for execution is definitely up there among the worst. Well, we're inside now, and it's about the welcome I expected. 
This mission is definitely a bit of a maze to navigate. I'd say it's the hardest to figure out too. I really didn't ever need to look up answers to puzzles or anything because they're honestly all pretty easy, but with this one, I was stuck because it's kind of insane. I can bet this mission probably frustrated a lot of people back in the 90s. Trying to play this on a PS1 was probably a nightmare. The look and aesthetic is very cool though. This red hallway looks like it was ripped straight from the fourth movie. There's a lot of little things that will get you killed or confuse you on this level though. Walls that bounce your blaster shots back at you, trip mines hidden around corners, blast shields that flicker on and off that you need to figure out when to run through, that sort of thing. There's also like six different coded doors where you need to find the right code combination and input it, which was a cool little feature at first, but it gets exhausted in this mission. The real nuisance, however, is the elevator situation. There's two of them, both nearly identical, but located in different blocks. You have to ride one of them to a certain level, then break into the ventilation system above it, then drop down on top of that elevator in order to access the area where they're keeping Maydeen which, after slaughtering the local Imperial presence, we're able to do. Okay, Jan, I rescued Nadine. Don't hang around, let's get out of here before any more troopers arrive. If I had a quarter for every time I've rescued General Crix Maydeen on this channel, I'd have two quarters. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. From the outer rim to the core systems, Calcetti is part of the Metellos trade route, where an Imperial docking port is located called Ramsey's Head. The primary purpose of this port is to act as a base of operations for making runs to the ice planet of Antivi, which is our true destination. According to our intel, there's a robotics facility on Antivi called Ice Station Beta, where construction is underway for a second phase of Dark Troopers. The only way there is via smuggling ship with the nav coordinates, which is why we're on Calcetti. We may not know how to find the facility, but someone here does. So we need to find one of the ships docked here set for travel to Antivi, plant a tracking device, and see where it goes. There's very little to say on this mission. Things sort of progress through a variety of shipment rooms, and there's some puzzle solving. So given that we're about halfway through the game, now feels like a great time to talk about the gameplay. It's really simple, as you can see. Shoot a lot of people, or droids, find the thing, click on it, and move on. The thing I really want to touch on is the platforming. Most of these Star Wars games have had platforming, but it has always felt really terrible to play. The character and controls have been unreliable, the camera strange. Even in Bounty Hunter, a game released seven years later, had some rough platforming. But this? I guess due to the sheer simplicity, feels great. The movement and jump is responsive, and if I miss a jump, it feels like my fault. The majority of complicated platforming comes in the second half of the game, but it's all totally playable. I'm not sure how much of this is due to playing on modern hardware with modern controls, but I imagine anyone going to play it now would be doing it in similar fashion to how I am here, so just know it plays well. Back to the mission, we fight our way through a series of hallways, find a place to plant the tracker, and we get out of there. As expected, the ship departed and flew straight to the robotics facility. According to Jan, this whole planet is reportedly lifeless. The only thing here is the very station we're here to destroy. To do this, we're bringing along three sequencer charges and placing them around the facility's different exchange couplings to essentially demolish it. There's a feature in the game where you can find ice cleats that help you navigate the slick surfaces that will otherwise throw you around the map, which I find kind of ridiculous given this is the only level in the whole game that has icy terrain. Never mind that though, gotta focus on riding this conveyor belt into the building. Okay, well, that was surprisingly easy. Hey look, highly toxic chemicals that will kill me if I fall into them. I better find a gas mask that I'll use like twice in the whole game. Here is where I was second guessing because I realized I needed to jump down this hole next to a giant spinning fan blade. But yes, that is indeed what I had to do. Come on, I've killed dark troopers, I can do this. Hey, well that worked. Now to set the charges and get out of here. Thanks to my gas mask, I can do so without dying to these chemicals. Two down, last one. All charges set. Good job. Let's blow this ice cube. Woman after my 
All right, awesome. We're ready to go, and that's a dark trooper. No, that's a big stormtrooper. A darker trooper? It's dangerous, and it's going to kill me if I don't take it down. All right, well, with that thing out of the way, now I just need to navigate these tunnels, and that's another dark trooper. I mean, I guess this is where they've been making the things, but damn, they are everywhere out here. There's the Moldy Crow. Time to bail, blow this planet to hell, and watch the ice melt from orbit. The Smuggler's Den, or Smuggler's Moon if you prefer, otherwise known as Nar Shadda, a massive city built around the moon orbiting the notorious planet of Nal Hutta, homeworld of the Huts, i.e. the last place anyone with a bounty on their head would ever want to be, or the best place if you're good at laying low, which Kyle is not. So of course here we are after being informed there's a death mark on us, which is worse than a bounty. I'm not wanted dead or alive, they just want me dead. But all traces of the coordinates from the ships leaving Antivi led back here, so the best shot we have at finding the source of these dark troopers is to get our hands on the Imperial nav charts from one of the smuggler's ships. Visually, I feel this is the best looking level in the game. It's the most unique, I'd say, with ambitious attempts at depicting the massive city through the windows, graffiti on various walls, and even some 3D skyscrapers we can see when outside of a building. They know we're here though, and they want the credits that come with my corpse, so let's make this fast. Oh good, an Imperial presence as well. Two separate factions currently out for my head. Guess I should have figured as much given my recent jobs, but that does mean I'm getting close to those navigational charts. That's a long way down. Guess we'll have to jump! And I missed it. Well, I didn't take much damage, so that's good. These trip mines are already becoming the bane of my existence. They'll be the end of it if I'm not careful. Can I make that jump? No, I'm no Jedi. I think this is probably my favorite level design-wise. The attempt at making a big city in an MS-DOS game from 1995 is beyond ambitious, and they really went all in on it. There's propaganda posters, glowing signs. It's about as visually distinct as I think we could expect from a game in this era. All right, now we're making some progress. This scaffolding is near where Jan dropped me off. That means the nav chart's gotta be close. Bingo. Now let's get the hell off this moon before something bad happens. Jabba, what have you done with Jan? If any harm comes to her, I'll personally shove my blaster down your slimy throat. I wish you were here too, Jabba. There's nothing like roast kale dragon. Well, Kyle just got told he was being fed to a kale dragon by one of the galaxy's worst crime lords and essentially just told him he was going to kill that dragon. So I guess that's what we're doing, with our bare hands. Seriously, we have to beat this thing to death with just our hands. 
These big lizards are the smaller cousin species to the significantly larger crate dragons, and just like the crate dragons, Kel dragons are also indigenous to Tatooine. After putting a stop to that beast, we can make our way to the next room where we need to do that same thing again. Something tells me that won't be the last we see of these things either. Jabba apparently keeps several aboard the Star Jewel, which is the name of his ship. Man, Kyle lucked out only needing to fend off Gamorreans with melee weapons. We'd be in bad shape if we were being shot at and all we had was grit and a bad attitude. Now where are they hiding my stuff? I'm thinking it's gotta be nearby. Ah, there we go. I got my armor, jacket, weapons, and the works. Now let's find Jan and get off this nasty ship. Between the dragons, the Gamorians, the hut, imagine the smell. Playing this game would probably be a lot more fun if I didn't have to deal with these damn trip mines around every corner. Ah, and there's another Kel Dragon. I knew it. He's just got these things wandering his ship. Working for Jabba must pay really well because it's gotta be miserable. Okay, got some winding hallways going on here. It may not be Tatooine technically, but this is definitely some Tatooine architecture. Ah, and here's my Navicard. Let that be a lesson. Don't steal back things I stole or I'll annihilate your employees and exterminate your pets. Don't look at me like that. Jabba is a literal crime lord slug and all of these people are thugs. All right, there's the moldy crow. Jan has to be in one of these cells somewhere. Is a crow even an animal in Star Wars? Is that like a translation? Does that mean, hey look, there's Jan. Let's get off this ship. Why are we on Coruscant in the middle of the Imperial City, you ask? Well, the Navicard we stole on Nar Shadda is encrypted, and the only way to decrypt it is with an Imperial decryption key, and the only one we know the location of is in an Imperial Security Operations building on Coruscant within the Imperial City. General Maydeen has arranged for Jan to have security code access to get us onto the landing pad nearest to the ISO building. Our job is to break in, insert the Nava chip into the decryptor, then grab it and get back to the ship. Easier said than done. This is a straight up suicide mission, but because Kyle has hired help, we're expendable to the Alliance. So I'm guessing they aren't counting on our success. Still, we gotta try and see it through. As expected, the place is crawling with stormtroopers. Heavily fortified and we're not getting any backup. Right now, the element of surprise and speed are our only advantages. After all, no one would be so stupid as to march into the heart of the Empire and start blasting their way through to the security operations building of all places. Well, they didn't count on Kyle Katarn having nothing to lose and a grudge against the Empire. Ah, there it is. That's our building. Now if we can just fight our way to the control room, we can insert the Navicard and get out of here before they call in reinforcements. I know the Emperor is vain, but are the statues really necessary, Palps? And what do we have here? It's some kind of heavy artillery weapon. Same thing the dark troopers have been firing at me. Well, now we can even the odds. And here we have another puzzle. There aren't like a ton in the game, but this one is a little frustrating at first. I was able to solve it relatively quickly, however, and get to the decryptor. All right, that's the decryptor. Let's slide in the card and bam, we're in business. Sounds like Jan's in trouble. Might be reinforcements. I better get back there. Rushing back to the landing pad, who do we see but Boba Fett himself? He seems pretty pissed off, and I assume that he's here to collect that death mark. Not today, Fett. This is a fight you never stood a chance of winning. Not with my prototype Imperial super weapon on my shoulder. We're in the endgame now. 
That data we decrypted from those navigational cards revealed a cargo ship route straight back to the Imperial Super Star Destroyer, the Executor. Darth Vader's personal flagship. That's not what we're after, though. Trying to take that out alone really would be a suicide mission. No, the Executor is just the gate to our real target, the Arkhammer. The smaller Imperial ship where the Dark Trooper Project operates from. The only way to get to that ship, however, is to get on board the Executor and wait until it hyperspaces to the Arkhammer's location. From there, I can smuggle myself straight to the Arkhammer and take it out from the inside. Like I said, it's practically a suicide mission. So I assume Kyle wants to die at this point, but I mean, we just beat two Kel Dragons to death with our fists and assaulted a building in the Imperial Capital, so who knows? The only way to get aboard the Executor is to hijack a smuggler's vessel already planned to board it. Fortunately for us, the navigational data we decrypted also revealed that there is a smuggler ship with Dark Trooper resources planned to stop and refuel at Fuel Station Ergo, which means all we have to do is board the station, wait for the ship to dock, and make our way to hijack it, then fly right into the hangar of the Executor. So that's where we are and what you've been watching. I'm currently fighting my way through the occupants of the fuel station to make my way over and hijack the ship I need. And that looks like exactly the ship I came for. Okay, Jen. Smuggler ship secured. Good job, Kyle. Now launching. I'll see you on the dark side, Jen. Good luck, Kyle. And may the force be with you. One thing's for sure. They'll never see me coming. Just like back on Coruscant, our biggest advantage is the element of surprise. They're expecting a friendly smuggler to exit, not a lunatic with a death wish. So we break through the doors, blasters blazing. Mother ah. who plants a trip mine by a door for an expected guest? Well, I guess they knew something was wrong. All right, we're on the executor, and as expected, the fact that they didn't know I'd be here until like just now is my only advantage. We need to find the ship with the coordinates to the Arkhammer ASAP. Every second I spend aboard this ship, the likelihood of a metaphorical imperial fist squashing me like a bug increases. So we gotta bolt through these hallways like the fate of multiple worlds depends on it. Which they do. So far so good actually, and they have dark troopers on board because why wouldn't they? Good thing I brought this weapon with me from the imperial city because it just saved my life from those dark troopers. That was a lot of troopers for a hangar. Oh look, a TIE fighter. Need to count my blessings that the pilot didn't spin around and start firing. That being said, the whole ship is likely on the highest alert right about now, so it's past time for my ex. That is a lot of stormtroopers. It's a lucky thing they're all lining up in the hallways like this. The platforming makes a return, and let me tell you, this area had the potential to be infuriating if the game didn't control as smoothly as it does. All right, the ship I'm looking for should be right through this room. Okay, they've got more dark troopers on board. Two against one, I'm literally outnumbered and outgunned. Fortunately, I've got a speed advantage. And with some finesse, I dispatch both of the super soldiers with some ease. I'm close to my exit now, running out of time by the minute. Bingo, there's my ticket out of here. Just gotta get this shipment on board the shuttle and ride it straight to the Arkhammer. Almost there, and... Bingo. Bon voyage and better luck next time, Imperials. In and out like a bullet. When the Empire blames this on a terror attack, they can use my name, Kyle Katarn. I haven't been showing the mission briefing screen so far, but now is the best time to cover those. This exact screen is shown before each level. The only thing that changes is the text on the right, providing story context and mission objectives each time. I wanted to show it this time because it's the coolest screen as we see photos of the Phase 1 and Phase 2 Dark Troopers we've been facing. It's a primitive way to go from mission to mission, I'll admit, but this game was made with MS-DOS in mind after all. Honestly, this was probably groundbreaking at the time. Anyway, we have one more level to go, so let's finish this. Here we are, the Arkhammer, home base of the Dark Trooper Project. We blow this thing, and the galaxy can rest easy for a night. 
There's no way I can mess this up. Okay, round two, for real this time. This ship is littered with dark troopers too. Plus these mechanical arms. I fell for the idea that they were just part of the ship, but they will in fact try to hit you and kill you. It's about this point things start getting really hard. Activate the dark troopers. For the final mission, I gotta say, they really brought it. The design is spectacular. Every area looks vibrant and detailed. No room looks lacking in design or love. LucasArts clearly wanted the player to feel both rewarded and determined when they got to this mission. And that's a lot of dark troopers. Aside from the dark troopers stalking and trying to kill you all the time, this level is honestly difficult just to even navigate. There's a lot of jumping across platforms, navigating maze-like conveyor belt areas. Not again. Yes, again. And just overall, it's probably the most complex level to play through. Finally, I'm able to reach the three ports and place my sequencer charges. But that only invited more dark troopers to my location. This is the main hangar, and all we have to do is get to that shuttle and we're home free. At this point, we've probably destroyed like two dozen dark troopers, so I'm not sure anything could surprise me now. All right, he's got a giant mega dark trooper uniform. Well, that's our guy, so let's take him out and finally put an end to this. With him dead, there's nothing between us and the shuttle. It's time to say goodbye to the Imperial Dark Trooper Project. setback. The force is strong with Katan. That's it! Star Wars Dark Forces. What a great game it is too. I've previously said on the channel that Rogue Squadron was the best Star Wars game I've played so far, but this really replaced it. I loved going through this adventure, especially since I never really got to play it as a child. I've played the first mission or two, but this was genuinely the first time I got to experience most of it. For as old as it is, the gameplay is smooth as butter, the graphics have aged like wine now just coming across as charming, and the story, while insane, is very endearing. This game is sort of an icon of the Legends continuity, being known as sort of a cult classic in Star Wars media, and let me just say, there is good reason for that. Before we wrap up, however, there's just a few more things I want to talk about. You know I love when a game has good music, and Dark Forces has some fantastic tracks for us to appreciate. I've talked about this a lot on this channel, but a huge portion of these old Star Wars games literally just used the Williams music instead of having original music produced for their title. Dark Forces did not do this. I'm not sure if it was due to limitations or if it was a creative decision, but LucasArts brought in Clint Bajakian, to put together an original MIDI score for Dark Forces. And I'm happy to report, it's great. Every track feels like something totally Williams adjacent, like it's suited exactly for a Star Wars game, but it's part of the main story, which is exactly what I'm craving when I play one of these. I wanna feel like I'm seeing something else in the universe. Clint has worked on a lot of games since then, contributing his talents to assist on the scores for major titles like God of War, Uncharted, and even Death Stranding. 
As for Dark Forces, a lot of the motifs from the Williams music do make their way into the score, but they're always tastefully implemented, so well done Clint and well done Dark Forces. I mentioned before that as of this video's release, Night Dive's unexpected remaster of Dark Forces has been announced but not released yet. Everything I have seen looks promising though. The cutscenes look better than ever, gameplay looks smooth, and if I had to make a few predictions, I'd wager the new menu and pre-mission tablets will be totally revamped into something way more modern. Possibly a complete new optional soundtrack in modern music to replace the MIDI. I'm also thinking Night Dive might add extra missions, a mission pack or something, but I'm not as certain on that one. It's not a remake, but it looks like it'll be really fun all the same, and maybe even become the optimal way to experience the first tale of Kyle Katarn. I'm really hoping so. The remaster announcement certainly came as a surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. Look, I know I've been really hard on the Disney stuff in past videos, and, well, that's because I kind of hate most of it. But I'll be fair and say this story is pretty silly. It's honestly unbelievable if it wasn't just context for players to shoot animated sprites in. I mean, one guy blows up multiple facilities, fights off a small army, infiltrates an Imperial prison, breaks into the Imperial capital, beats Boba Fett, storms Vader's flagship, and destroys a whole Star Destroyer all by himself. I mean, I get that he's supposed to be force sensitive here, but that resume puts Luke and Starkiller to shame. I really give its absurdity a pass because of what they were going for, you know? I'll still probably rag on Disney, but the truth is I don't hate everything they've done. There's a few things I really like, and I'll talk about that more in a later video too, but I am a Legends guy through and through. As for the game, Dark Forces is a genuine highlight in regards to Star Wars media. I don't have a negative word to say on it. No criticisms that would be fair for the game in respect to when it was released. It's just a great title and something I would be thrilled to have as part of my universe, not to retcon and replace it with something like a mediocre movie, but I mean, who would do that? Man, what a ride. As always, thank you everyone for watching. I know I'm a young channel, but believe it or not, this game was actually heavily requested on my other videos in the comments, which is something I'm more than happy to oblige. To my fellow Star Wars fans, stick around because I've got a lot more Star Wars content coming. But to those who like my other videos, no worries, my output will remain eclectic and varied. If you're really loving the content and want to support me, then consider becoming a member of the channel. You'll get early access to these videos since I do them in parts. Members get certain parts of my long videos early, as well as access to my Discord if you're wanting to come hang out with me and my crew. If you're wanting to keep up with my day to day, you can always follow me on X, that's where I'm most active. Otherwise, I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, that's all I've got for you.